Welcome to the Activated Storyteller's 20th Podcast, November 2nd, 2006. This week's story is Isis and the Seven Scorpions, an Egyptian tale. Hi, I'm Dennis. And I'm Kimberly. And I'm Zephyr. And we're the Activated Storytellers. This week we are podcasting from San Jose, California. Do you know the way to San Jose? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, we do. We're here at the San Jose Fairgrounds because Zephyr is doing something special this week. What are you doing, Zephyr? He's working at a haunted house. (laughs) Wow, that was like the vocal equivalent of those cheesy Halloween decorations that you get in the store. Anyway, yes, I'm out here working at Carlson Manor in uh, at the fairgrounds in San Jose, California. It's totally awesome. I've been here about uh, five days now, and we're recording this on Halloween, uh, actually, so this will be my sixth night here. Another interesting thing is we are parked right across the street from a cemetery, a large old cemetery, which is kind of appropriate, perhaps, to be across the street from a haunted house. But anyway, the cemetery has some graves of historical significance, including several members of the Donner Party. You may remember a few episodes back, we talked about uh, the Oregon Trail and the people, the pioneers who came across the Oregon Trail. And some of them took a southerly route, deciding it might be a shortcut. Well, that was the Donner Party. They ended up being trapped for the winter. Yes, and one of the members of the party buried in this cemetery survived the trip, and he was 10 years old at the time. We have also visited the Rosicrucian Museum here in San Jose. Yes, the Rosicrucian Museum is in Rosicrucian Park, which takes up an entire city block, and uh, it's all done in an Egyptian motif. You walk in through these gates with big cartouches on them, and they have sphinxes and an obelisk, and also it's, it's a very peaceful place to peaceful place it's a very peaceful place for people to (laughs) (laughs) i'm not editing this it's it is it it is a very serene location for individuals to go and sit and relax and whatever and they seem to be making an effort to maintain this ancient atmosphere removed from all modernity because we had a hard time even finding the bicycle rack it was way around the corner Rosicrucian Park is world headquarters for the Rosicrucian Order, which is a a very old mystical order. It's not a religion, and they claim that they can trace their roots all the way back to ancient Egypt, which is why they have such an interest in Egyptology. But even if you aren't interested in the history of the order, I think you'll find the Rosicrucian Museum a really fascinating place to visit. Well, I know I did. One of the things we got to do was to tour a tomb. The guides take you into the tomb, and they tell you about it, and they describe how the hieroglyphics work. And um, one thing, when you're down, well, first of all, you walk into the tomb, and there is an offering room, and they describe that. And on one side of the offering room, um, the, the visitors are welcome there. The person who is buried in the tomb wants visitors there. They want their family to come visit them and to bring them food to sustain them in the afterlife is the way the Egyptians believed it. So on one side of the room is where you would put the food, and then on the other side they have a picture of the um, person who is buried in the tomb who basically has an engraved feast on the wall. He is always eating. and They believe that whatever you write in hieroglyphics will become true. Because according to the religion of the ancient Egyptians, it was supposed to take 20 years to get to the afterlife. So uh, they would have all of this food to sustain them on the journey to the afterlife. And again, the hieroglyphics, uh, what's painted is on hieroglyphics is supposed to be true. So in case there was a year where there was a famine or or maybe the crops weren't as good and the family members couldn't come and, and offer the food that they normally would, that's why they would have these feasts engraved on the walls. Yeah, and then inside the tomb, on the east wall, which is the side uh, that the sun rises on, that wall would represent birth and life. And they would have a picture of the guy buried in the tomb doing things that he did in life. He had to do the same job in the afterlife. 
Um, so they've got all kinds of pictures about life and what would go on, parties, juggling, um, people paying taxes, and you know everything from their day-to-day life. On the south wall would be painted things like hunting and fishing, and they'd want to show whoever's buried in the tomb would be showed as being very skilled, knowing what they were doing. So in this particular one, they have the guy who was fishing, and he gets two fish on one hook. Uh, And then on the west wall is sunset and death and meeting the gods, and on the north wall is the judgment. They have a picture of um, a heart being weighed against the feather of truth. And you get the impression from touring a museum like this that the entire culture of ancient Egypt was built around death because they made some really elaborate and lengthy preparations for uh, for death. The, the mummification process was extremely complicated and time-consuming. They, they have some actual mummies on display here, including not only human mummies, but there's a mummy of a uh, gazelle. There's a mummy of a fish, which is supposed to be food for the human mummies to eat, I guess. I like... The mummy, it was up on the second floor. They have a mummy in, in a case, and you could see the skull and everything, and that was cool. And these relics on display are quite old. Some of them are 4,000 years old or older. They also had a replica of the Rosetta Stone. For the longest time, they lost, they forgot what the hieroglyphics meant. They had no idea, and people would make up pic- stories thinking that the hieroglyphics were picture graphs. Um, And then they found the Rosetta Stone, which was the key to finding out what the hieroglyphics really did mean. That's one of the interesting things about the hieroglyphics is that despite the fact that they are pictures, they are actually more meant to be like letters. Kind of phonetic. Right. They're they're phonetic sounds. They're not actually intended to be picture graphs. Also, they had a replica of the Laws of Hammurabi. Since we are recording this on Halloween, we might mention that when we got to the museum— the workers there were in costume, and we thought, since, since most of them were Egyptian costumes, we thought, hey, this, they must dress like this all the time. I wish they did. They had some really great costumes on. Um, you can find out more about the Rosicrucian Museum at EgyptianMuseum.org. EgyptianMuseum.org. And now we are on to our story. This is, of course, an Egyptian story. It is the Egyptian folktale of Isis and the seven scorpions. Long, long ago, Isis and Horus were hiding in a papyrus swamp. Shh. Quiet. Okay. Why are we hiding? Just because. Don't let anybody see us. Okay. It was a very elaborate game of hide-and-seek. In any case, one day Isis decided to leave the papyrus swamp. I'm going out now. Does that mean I'm it? Yes. Goodbye. Whenever she left, she always brought seven scorpions with her. One, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, where are you? Baffin, Baffin, Ah, seven. This was in case any of the other players tried to tag her while she was out. So she would walk along. Okay. Pet it. Pet it. Yes, I, I'm here. I'm here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jet that. Uh, uh, <coughs> <coughs> yeah. <coughs> and met it. Yeah, I'm here. Go on ahead and look for any danger. Go on. All right. Yay, I gotta go. Yay, I'm in first. Uh huh. Come on, hurry. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. <coughs> Get that stinger out of my face. Come on, let's go. <coughs> You go first. I, 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 I seem to have papyrus fever. <laughs> ah, now then, mess it at. What? Mess it at. Uh, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm right, right here, right here. Okay, now you come along with me and Baffin and Teffin. Uh, why, why, why? Do we have to go along, too? Yes. Now you bring up the rear. Come along. Let's go. So, Isis was traveling through the town of the two sisters in the Nile Delta. Oh, no. What an odd party arriving. Oh, my goodness. Seven scorpions and, oh, that woman who is, oh, they are not going to come into my home. Well, she really thinks she's something, doesn't she? <laughs> I, I wonder why she shut the door in her face. I don't know, but can we find some place to sleep? We'll find some place else to stay. Really, we will. 
and indeed they did find another place to stay. A young peasant girl, whose house was not very big, offered up her house to Isis and the seven scorpions to stay. Oh, come inside. Come inside. I have not much to offer, but surely you can find some rest here. I will keep you safe. <laughs> We, 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 we really don't want to, you know, trouble anyone or, or, or anything. Uh. Oh, now, now, it's quite all right. Thank you for being so kind to me and my seven scorpions. But the scorpions were still not too happy about how rudely they had been treated by the rich noblewoman. I think we ought to get even with her. Let's go sting her son. Yeah, that's a good idea. But maybe we should just send one of us out. But no one of us has a strong enough venom to, to kill anybody. Hmm. Well, uh, do, do what? I got an idea. Why doesn't everybody give me their venom so I'll have seven times as much venom in my little stinger? Oh, I'd be happy to. <laughs> Sounds like a good idea. <laughs> Sounds like a good idea to me. I think so. So, all the scorpions put together their poison into the one scorpion stinger, and Tefan, when no one was looking, snuck out the house to find the rich noblewoman's son. Yeah, there you are. No! Ow! Mommy! Mommy! Uh, yes? Oh, no! Oh, you're turning all blue and purple and red and... Oh, oh, help! Help! Oh, I need help! Meanwhile, back in the peasant girl's house, Isis heard the woman's cries. Oh, why, it's that woman who shut her door in my face. Whatever is the matter? Oh, oh, and my son, my son. He's, oh, he's all green and yellow and, oh, I need help. Of course, Isis knew right away why the rich noblewoman's son was changing colors so quickly and knew just what to do to heal the woman's son. Oh, no, he's on the verge of death. Here, here, let me help. Let me help. So Isis whispered magic words over the woman's son. Now then, my child, go on. Can't stand to see an innocent child harmed. Off with you. Oh, oh, thank you, great Isis. Thank you, thank you. I, I, I am so terribly sorry for not being welcoming earlier. I, I don't deserve all of my wealth. Oh, here, Isis, I give it to you and and to this young peasant girl who has shown you such kindness when I did not. And that's the story of Isis and the Seven Scorpions. Which we made very similar to another famous story involving seven characters. In fact, it is similar. Yeah, I think it does have a, a very similar motif. You'll notice a lot of a lot of that in folktales, actually. They borrow ideas and motifs and themes from one another and put them all together and maybe sometimes in different ways but there's a lot of uh, a lot of similar stories from different cultures so what was it similar to what else has seven characters who try to protect their um their maiden snow white and the seven dwarfs, of course. Um, and for more stories, we have already done another Egyptian story on one of our early podcasts. And you can, um, of course, still go back and listen to that. It is available. It is Rhodopis, which is a version of a Cinderella story. It's the Egyptian Cinderella story may even be a true story. It's a story about a Greek slave who was kidnapped and brought over to Egypt and who ends up marrying a pharaoh. And they think that uh, it is actually a true story. So you might want to check that one out if you haven't already listened to it. We will be catching you next week. Our next podcast will debut on Thursday, November 9th. We'll see you then. The Activated Storytellers perform at schools and libraries nationwide. On stage, we use American Sign Language, physical comedy, imaginative props, and a giant oversized book to bring the stories to life. For booking information, check our website at www.activated-storytellers.com, where you can also find out when the Activated Storytellers will be performing near you, read a story, or order one of our audio CDs. Until next time.